All right, let's get started. So thank you for coming to talk about bulk data. I'm Josh Mandel. I'm going to be showing you uh, a set of slides and some demos over the course of the next 40 minutes. If you want to follow along, there's a link to the slide deck here that I'll leave at the top of the screen for a little while, bit.ly slash smartfiretech. Uh, and there's links to the slides here and for the other presentations uh, that we've done this week at Dev Days. Uh, I would love to keep this interactive. So as we're going through the presentation, if you've got questions, certainly if something is unclear, uh, please raise your hand or, or shout out. Um, I think we'll have time to go through the content uh, and we'll certainly try to save some time for questions at the end, but don't feel fr uh, don't hesitate. Do feel free uh, to, to just shout out if something comes up as we go. So I want to talk with you today about uh, a, a few things. I'm going to start off with motivations for this fire bulk data project. Uh, and these are some motivations that Dan Gottlieb compiled when he was at Boston Children's Hospital. So we're working on the Smart Health IT project uh, and generally talking with many companies uh, and also academic health centers trying to do interesting and new things with healthcare data. So for example, a big academic medical center uh, that has progress notes coming in uh, to a from a third party clinic that they want to be able to synchronize uh, into their EHR. Uh, or a population health system that uh, could rely on data, clinical data from the EHR, but there's no convenient way to move the data in. Um, or a startup that wants to do machine learning on top of clinical data, uh, but they need training data from the EHR. Think back to the presentation that we heard from Patrick Sundberg at Google yesterday. Uh, there are very common needs for moving data around about populations. And if you think about it, the smart API has been focused on sort of one patient at a time. Fire has ways to query for data across patients. So you can do, for example, a search on a Fire server for all the observations on the whole server um, across patients. But if there's a very large number, um, it doesn't perform very well. And if you look at what happens in the real world every day when people need to address these kinds of use cases, uh, there, there are some common patterns. So many different things. Uh, we, we talked about a few, but also interactions between pairs uh, and providers working on a shared population together, trying to help the payers understand more about the clinical status of patients and trying to help the clinical providers understand more about the, the financial status and the, the coverage that a patient has, uh, bringing claims data into the EHR, integrating clinical data warehouses, handling submission of uh, disease, reportable diseases to a registry. Um, the common approach that we see today, um, it takes a lot of hard work and it's cumbersome. So the, the most common thing that we see people doing when they have to solve a problem like this today uh, is they come up with some kind of scheme it's usually a comma-separated value file, uh, and they'll get on the phone and they'll talk about exactly what columns of data they need to extract from the system. And somebody on the database administration side will write a report, um, and they'll, they'll agree on what that report will look like, and they'll agree about some way to share those reports. So maybe it's going to be um, an FTP job that runs every day or every week, and, and we'll agree on credentials, or maybe we'll get the VPN set up. Uh, and once you work through all those steps, then you're able to share data between two projects for one purpose. Uh, and this kind of process repeats itself over and over again across provider organizations. It's a common pattern, highly inefficient. Um, and there's a combination of proprietary data uh, and manual or proprietary ways of moving those data around. Um, so the intuition here is we'd like to lean on the Fire API to help with these kinds of things. It feels like the kind of problem that Fire really uh, is designed to solve. So we'll talk through, uh, as we started working on this uh, about a year ago, the evolution of a specification that we've been building on, on top of Fire and contributing back to Fire to make these use cases uh, work more efficiently. So the, the goal is to invent as little new as possible. Lean on Fire, for example, for the resources. These are a great set of standardized data models uh, in healthcare. Don't want to invent any of that work. Fire um, has a, w an operations framework, and the goal for us was to create a new operation that would kick off um, a kind of export job. So we'll talk about how that works. We'll talk about the technology and some of the community behind it uh, and some of the tools that are available to let people try this out uh, in the real world. Uh, so the goal was to cover both the exchange uh, of clinical data, so the, the data APIs, and also the security APIs to provide a consistent way for a client to connect to many different kinds of servers uh, to be able to do this sort of bulk data transfer. Um, and the goal was to really focus on that one problem of exporting data from a source system and to leave a lot of the downstream processing out of scope. So for example, if you've got a system like this where you can do an export in a standardized way, somebody might say, well, what I really want to do is export and de-identify. Uh, and our approach here was rather than trying to, to create like a de-identification standard, 
we've said, well, we think we can connect these components in a pipeline. So if you've got an export step here, and you've got a company that knows how to do a cool uh, practical de-identification step here, let's plug them together into a pipeline so you can start to get some efficiencies. Uh, you know, similarly, if you need to recode vocabularies or terminologies, rather than saying, okay, we're going to have a, a standard for doing export with recoding, we say, no, we're going to do the export, uh, and then we can find a mapping step that happens later in the pipeline. We can start to stitch these pieces together in a standard way. Um, or if you want to do encryption so that when you finally ship the data off to a partner, um, it's, it's encrypted in a way maybe that the partner can't read um, or that they'll need to combine other key material uh, in order to read. Uh, Again, rather than saying, well, we need a standard for encrypted export, we said, we'll have a, a standard way to do the export, and then you can build into a pipeline a module that handles things like encryption. So that's the overall kind of architecture that we're trying to approach here and come up with the sort of narrowest piece that we can um, to achieve these design goals. Basically focus on automating the communication uh, with what we call uh, a back-end service, which is to say a computer program that's running on a server somewhere that needs to talk to a clinical data somewhere uh, and exchange fire resources. Uh, and the goal is uh, to lean on technologies that are pretty well understood and pretty widely supported um, and, and have the smallest API surface area we can, reuse as much of the Fire API as possible, uh, reuse as much of the authorization approach that we've worked through with this community in the past, um, and to create a system that is efficient enough to be a viable way of exchanging data about whole populations um, all at once. And so looking or learning from the experience that we see very broadly today where people are sharing flat files of CSVs from system to system, we said, you know what, this is a pretty boring, standard, simple thing to do to create export files. Let's use that as a starting point uh, for being able to export fire data from a system to create files that contain large numbers of fire resources uh, and to be able to share them. And our scope in this project was really to cover the APIs for moving data around and to cover the security APIs, but not to cover things like a legal framework for organizations that want to come up with an agreement to work together. So in the context of US healthcare, there's a lot on uh, business associate agreements and, and HIPAA provisions, for example, which we've left out of scope. Uh, we aren't trying to tackle the problem of real-time notifications. So for example, if you're synchronizing data about a whole population, it might be nice to know uh, the moment that somebody arrives in the emergency department or the moment that new lab tests show up. Um, that's all valuable, important stuff, but it's not in the scope for what we're doing in this fire bulk data project. Um, and finally, we're not trying to approach patient matching. Uh, the goal here is to let a system that's got patient records export those records using the identifiers and uh, the clinical data elements that are already stored in that source system. So I'll walk you through the architecture that we're using here, uh, which is a set of interactions between a client and a server. So you'll see the client on the left-hand side of the diagram uh, and the server on the right. And this is a sequence diagram, so time is moving sort of down. Uh, so the first step that happens is the client sends a request to the server that says, hey, I would like you to start an export of data, please. So that's what we call the dollar sign export operation. And there's some parameters that we'll talk about to control exactly what gets exported. Um, so first of all, there's a few levels at which this export can be done. One is at the level of an entire server. Um, and this was actually the, the most recent thing to come out of our discussions. We realized it was an oversight in our initial design to say, I want to export all the fire resources in a server. Might not be practical inside of fire systems that are grafted on top of existing EHRs, but it's very practical if you think about a cloud native fire server that's running on top of a cloud database to just to say, do, do a data dump, get me everything out. So that's export at the server base URL. Uh, another thing you can do is say, I want to get all, I got out all the clinical data for all of the patients in the system. So that's slash patient slash dollar sign export. Uh, or you could say, I've got a group of patients. Maybe I'm an insurance company and I'm responsible for the care of a certain group. Uh, so please export data for all the patients that belong to this group. And those are the three levels of export that you can perform in this spec. And uh, so far it looks like same as calling any other fire operation uh, until we add the following header, which is prefer respond async. Uh, and that is to say the client isn't expecting to get a response that has all the data it's looking for right away, uh, but rather it's asking for an asynchronous response. Um, and we'll talk about how that asynchronous response works. There are a few additional parameters that the client can supply at the time of doing this export. Um, so one is what format should the exported data be in once it exists? Uh, and out of the box, we define exactly one format that's a required format, and that's ndjson, new line delimited json. We'll show an example of what that looks like. Uh, the client can also pass in a parameter called underscore since, which is to say I'm only looking for resources that have been updated on or after a particular 
uh, instant, a particular timestamp. The idea being that a client exports data once uh, when it first connects to a new system, and maybe it's going to connect you know, daily or weekly from then on, and it should be able to just ask for what's new. So the underscore since parameter asks, uh, gives, gives you a way to ask just for what's new since the last time you've checked in. Uh, and then we also have some very basic filters on the type of resources that you want to get back. So that's the underscore type parameter, which is basically a way for the client to provide a list of resource types that it's expecting to export. Uh, and I want to note here that some of the fire types are very coarse grained. So you can export observations, that's something you can ask for, but there's no way here to ask for just the vital signs observations or just the hemoglobin observations. It's a pretty coarse grained kind of mechanism for filtering uh, by type. Um, and we've added what we labeled as an experimental syntax if you want to do more fine-grained filtering, which leans on the Fire Search API. So anything you can express as a Fire Search, you can pass in as a, a type filter, which gives you a way to do finer grain requests. Uh, but we don't think it's something that every system is likely to support. So we've labeled it as experimental, and we're going to get some experience with it to see you know, whether that's actually a good level at which to uh, perform that kind of fine-grained export. So those are all the parameters on this kickoff request. And what happens is the server doesn't produce any data right away, but it does produce uh, a response header called content location. So that's a URL uh, where the server is telling client, here's where you should go uh, to make requests about the current status of this export job. Uh, so there's a job that's been kicked off, and it's running sort of in the background somewhere. And then what the client is expected to do is to request that URL from time to time to poll on that URL. Uh, and it'll, uh, so it gets back the content location as a result of that kickoff response with this 202 accepted header. Um, and then it can start to do this polling step where it does a get on that content location. And it'll get responses that are you know, something like this, where there might be a, a 202 header saying that this job is still accepted. Uh, there might be an x-progress header, which is simply a human-readable string that's designed to say something about how the job is coming along. So it could be a percent complete. Um, it, it could be just information about how long the job is, has been running, anything that would be suitable for showing a person. And then there's a retry after header, which is a hint to the client about how long it should wait before it makes another request. Uh, so we don't want to have a client hammering requests every 50 milliseconds on a job that's going to take six hours. Uh, this gives you a way to sort of balance out the client's expectations. Yes? Seconds. We'll check our spec later and see if it actually says that. I'm 90% sure it does. It does. Thank you. <laughs> uh, other questions at this stage? All right, keep running. Uh, so, so the client does this kind of polling, uh, and at some point, it's going to get back uh, something else, something other than this 202. It's going to get a 200, which says, OK, we've actually got um, some results for you. That is not just a set of headers, but along with that will be a body. A response body is this JSON payload that's going to tell the client not all the clinical data, but where to go and get it. So it's got a, an array in it called output with a list of these little file descriptors. Each one of these has a URL, and it has a type. And so the goal here is to do an export where at the end of this job, there's a bunch of files. Each file only has one resource type embedded in it. So you can easily take a file and load it into a database table, and you know which table to load it into. So a very common structure is you might have a table in your database for every file resource type. And so you can just pipe one of these files, uh, and you know exactly which table it needs to land in. Uh, so each file only has one resource type in it, but you could have multiple files with the same type. So I might have my patients split across three files if there's a lot of patients, and I might have my observations split across 300 files if there's really a lot of observations. And it's up to the server to decide sort of how big to make these files and, and where to set the boundaries. And the server responds with a list of as many uh, of these files as it has created, so the client can then go and fetch them. Um, one by one or, or in parallel. The server also can respond with a list of error results, uh, which could represent problems with an export. Uh, and those are represented using the operation outcome uh, data type, fire resource type. So the client gets this response body, uh, and then it's allowed to go and actually fetch all those resource files. And that's uh, about how it works. Uh, I want to say uh, a little bit about what we do on, on the fire side, which is totally context dependent. So in the context of US healthcare data exchange for clinical purposes, we say, we think the Argonaut profiles are a good place to start. If you want to share the common clinical data set, you know, go and look at those profiles. They've been uh, relatively well worked out. We think that's a great package of clinical data. But nothing about the way we've designed the spec 
is tied to a particular set of profiles. So in a different context, in a different country, you might use a different set of data profiles with the same specification for doing um, the export. Similarly, if, you sh if you're sharing financial data in the context of U.S. healthcare data exchange, today there are a few initiatives that are sort of setting out some rules and expectations and profiles about how to share explanation of benefit and coverage resources about a, a patient's health financial data. Um, one of those is the Blue Button Project from, uh, from CMS, the, the federal government sort of health healthcare plan. Um, and so we say that's a great package to look at if you're doing financial data export. But again, the spec is agnostic. So I mentioned earlier that the one required format we define for the export is NDJSON or New Line Delimited JSON. Uh, and that is uh, basically what you see here. Each line of the file has a single fire resource in it. Uh, and any new lines that existed in that fire resource are encoded as backslash N. Uh, so they're not actually a, a new line in the file. So when you're parsing one of these things, you can just read line by line and treat each line as a fire resource in JSON. Uh, and what's missing what you don't include in new, de new line delimited JSON uh, is it's not, the whole file is not a JSON array. So you don't need an opening uh, square bracket at the top or a closing square bracket at the bottom. And you don't need commas at the end of each line. Each line is a resource unto itself, and that's all. So if you know how to parse um, a text file and you know how to parse a fire JSON resource, it's very easy to put those pieces together and parse uh, a file like this. And it's used pretty commonly, new line delimited JSON as kind of a lingua franca for database systems where you want to be able to either import or export a large collection of resources at once. There are some more efficient formats for doing this kind of thing. Uh, there are formats like um, Parquet would be an example of a, of a binary format for, for doing a similar kind of packing of resources into a single file. Uh, but we started with new line delimited JSON uh, not because it performs the best, because it's dead simple and easy to support. We think over time we're going to see a broader set uh, of formats used there. So that's all of the, about the data API. We've also published a specification, or we're in the process of publishing a specification, for the security APIs to go hand in hand with this bulk data export, because we want to solve this end-to-end -end problem where a client needs to connect to a server um, pretty generically. So you don't have to use any particular security spec with that bulk data export workflow that I just showed you. But this is one that's been designed to work well with it. Uh, and we think it's, it's one that, uh, that we're reviewing in the context of the Argonaut project for US-based uh, data exchange. The idea here is that app registration or client registration with an EHR system is something that happens um, out of band. So it could be using something like a dynamic client registration protocol. It could be a registration that happens uh, by visiting a vendor portal or making a phone call. Uh, but somehow, an app registers itself with an with a EHR system. And it registers uh, a public key formatted as, as what's called a JSON web key set. Uh, it could be an RSA key. It could be an elliptic curve-based key. Uh, but it registers that key with the EHR so that later, when it needs to authenticate, uh, it can do so as using asymmetric um, signatures. Now, now, there are two ways that the app can actually do that registration. One is by directly supplying a public key, and two is by supplying a URL uh, to where the app's key set lives. Uh, and for a few reasons, we think the URL is, is the preferred pattern, mainly because it allows that app to later rotate out its keys. So if it wants to change its keys every month, that provides an in-band kind of mechanism for doing that key rotation. Did you have a question? Okay. Um, we also should say something about scopes. Uh, so as we do in smart for user facing apps, we also have a set of scopes for these backend services that want to get an access token. Uh, so for user facing apps, the scopes would start with patient slash or user slash, indicating that they're supposed to be good for getting data about one patient or all the patients that a given user has access to. Uh, here we have scopes that start with system slash, uh, indicating these are system level scopes that give you access to all the data in the system. And there could be caveats there, right? Under the hood, a given client may have authorization limitations that are imposed by an EHR. Um, but this system slash is a way for the client to say, here's what I'm expecting to get. Um, so scopes in OAuth are kind of negotiation. Client says, I need system slash patient.read and system slash observation.read. Uh, and the server at a high level can say, yep, I gave you all of them, or no, I gave you a subset. A server can even give the client more access than it asks for. The, the protocol just says the client asks for a set of scopes, and the server responds with a set of scopes. Um, and the goal here is to have the access tokens themselves, while they are bearer tokens, so all you need to do is include that token in an authorization header to use it, uh, they're short-lived. So on the order of five minutes are, is our recommendation, and a server, uh, uh, sorry, the backend service can fetch a new token uh, using this mechanism uh, anytime it needs to. So the 
the basic workflow uh, for fetching these tokens, just to sort of spell this out in the sequence diagram, is that first that registration happens ahead of time and out of band, and the client uh, registers its public key, and it gets an OAuth client ID. And then later, when the client needs to get an access token, one of those short-lived tokens, it creates uh, a signed request in the form of a JWT, a JSON web token, sends that request to the authorization server. The authorization server validates it, and assuming everything is, is valid, it returns with one of these short-lived access tokens that the client can use to start interacting with that bulk data uh, API. I won't spend much time going through sort of what's changed over the course of the spec, but I do want to share a little bit about the history of how the spec has been uh, developed and, and show you where it lives and some of the tools that we put together for working with this specification. Um, so first off, I should say this is a project that kicked off more or less um, in September of 2017. We got a group together at one of these HL7 working group meetings that, that was happening at the time. We had a conference in Boston where we worked with a number of uh, electronic health record vendors as well as uh, some healthcare uh, insurance companies uh, to work on some, some of the key use cases and to think about the technology. And over the course of 2018, we've had a, a group get together to hammer on the specification. Uh, so we've been working with the Argonaut project on getting feedback, on refining the spec, and on on, on um, performing an external security review of the specification. So that security review is currently in process, but we're already incorporating some of the first feedback from that, which is mostly tightening up some of the conformance language in the specification itself. Uh, and we had, I would say, uh, a period of pretty rapid change over the summer as folks were starting to build some prototype implementations and, and share their feedback. And the spec has been pretty stable over the course of the last three months. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about, about timing, but the goal is to publish uh, within the Argonaut group, publish a spec uh, by the end of 2018 or in early 2019. And the goal would be then to hand that off to the HL7 uh, kind of standards process to put this through a, a sort of formal balloting step. Um, but my goal has been to make sure that we can get some real world implementation experience and, and have a spec that's pretty stable before we try to go through that formal process of standardizing it. Uh, I want to show you some of the tools that we've built. Uh, and these have been developed uh, primarily by uh, Vlad Ignatov at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, first, of, first of all, there's a reference server, uh, and then there's also a reference client. So these live at bulkdata, bulk-data.smarthealthit.org. Uh, and if you saw the smart talk about the smart launcher, you'll see this looks pretty similar, uh, but it's specifically focused, for, uh, it's focused on providing access to a bulk data server. Uh, and the idea here is you can register a client with it. Uh, there's a few ways to do it. You can paste in your JSON web key set URL, if you're hosting that key set somewhere, uh, or you can supply a key set directly if you want to just paste it in. Uh, and if you don't have one, there's even a little tool in here that'll generate one for you, either uh, using uh, ES or, or RS384, well, either using an RSA key uh, or an elliptic curve based key. So you can generate a key set right here in the browser, uh, and then you can sort of configure how you want the server to act. So if you want to do some sort of quick testing as you're just getting started building uh, a client, you can say, I only want to have you know, 100 resources per file and give me a data set of 100 patients. So not really big data, uh, really more like tiny data. Uh, and this is going to work very quickly. You can also cause the server to simulate uh, a delay. So if you want to test out how your client works uh, when there's either a short time or a long time to actually generate it, you can configure it. But when you're first getting started testing, you probably want the server to just return as soon as possible a set of results. Um, so this would be like when you're first getting started, this is the, the easiest way to make the server fast and to make it your feedback loop very tight. Uh, and so when you set up all this configuration, uh, that gets memorialized in the URL. So if you are working with another developer in your organization or somewhere else and you want to both test against our demo server, you could just copy this whole URL and send it to somebody in an email and they'll, they'll paste it in and it'll get a configuration screen that is populated exactly like this one. Um, the save button here gives you an easy way to, to copy it, um, but it's just the same thing as copying the URL from the URL bar. Um, and you can also download the whole client configuration into a config file that is a format that works nicely with our, our sample client. So let me show you then some of our sample client or uh, client infrastructure. So once you've configured a server like this, you got all your settings there, you'll get what's called a fire server URL. And you could just copy this and treat it like the base URL of a fire server. So for example, I can paste it into my browser. Let's see if this works. I'll try to get metadata. Um, only the JSON format is supported. So if I want to do this properly, I'd have to do something like this. Uh, okay, so you'll get a, a metadata statement. Uh, and the thing is, this is going to act like the base server, the base URL of a fire server. 
Um, that's a server that doesn't have a lot of capabilities turned on. In fact, it basically doesn't support any of the Fire API at all, except for the bulk data export. So it's a super specialized server that we put together really for testing purposes. Uh, but it's a quick and easy way to get started, and there's like a Docker image for all this, so if you want to run it locally, uh, you can try it without a lot of delay. Uh, we also built a sample client, uh, which we can invoke. There's a web browser-based client, as well as a command line client. So if I just click this Try Sample App button, it'll launch the web browser-based client in a new tab. Um, and so you can basically ask it to do a kickoff job for patient-level export or system-level export. And you can say which resources you want to include in your, in your export job itself. And you can provide an underscore since parameter, which is in the form of this drop-down list. Uh, and then you can see exactly the URL that is prepared uh, th for, the, for the fire export URL. And then you can hit this kickoff button, prepare download. And what will happen is the server will start this kickoff request. The client, based on the web browser here, is going to pull uh, to wait for results to arrive. Uh, since I configured the server to return immediately, I didn't have to wait very long. Um, and then the server has returned a list of files. Uh, each of these has a URL. Uh, and I can follow each of these links to download a file. So for example, if I download um, the patient.nd.json file, there's only one of them in this case, I get a local file here uh, that's going to look like a lot of patients. There should be, I think, 100 of them, because that's what I selected when I was first configuring the server uh, in this control panel here. So that's some of the tools that you can use to try out the API. Uh, you can set up the server to respond with large amounts of data as well. So you can ask for a million resources per file on a million patients and you know, simulate it taking 10 minutes to do the export, that kind of thing. Uh, there's also a command line client that allows you to run these locally, and then it, it automatically downloads all the files from that list and gets you a local directory that has those files sitting in it. So that's a quick tour of the configuration tool of our GUI sample client. And I'm not going to do a live demo of the command line client, uh, but it has a very similar kind of workflow to the web browser-based client. It's just you'll automatically get a set of files downloaded locally. And there's links to this from the presentation if you want to try this out. Um, there's a Node.js app here for the, the GUI client, as, or for the CLI client as well. For all of you who are in here in this room with me and not over there in that room with Ryan Brush, uh, I recommend that you watch Ryan's talk after Dev Days. He's got a fabulous uh, set of tools that he's been working on uh, at Cerner and open sourcing, which start to get at the question of, what do you do with all this data once you've exported it? Uh, how can you start to ask interesting questions over large sets of data in an efficient way? I wanted to give you just a, a quick example here of the kind of thing that you can do once you've got a pile of these new line delimited JSON files either sitting uh, on your local hard drive or sitting in a cloud storage um, bucket or blob store somewhere um, off in, in the cloud. And so one tool among many uh, that you can use to do analysis on these kinds of data sets is Apache Drill. Another one is uh, Spark SQL. Uh, and these kinds of tools, you can point them to just a list of static files that are sitting on a drive somewhere. Uh, and it will figure out the sort of semi-structured uh, JSON of those resources and allow you to do things like running a SQL query over it. So you can, for example, summarize across all the files that start with observation star dot JSON. So it could be one or a hundred or a thousand files like that and say, show me all the codings that are used and find me the ones that are used the most often. So you get a list of, of the observations, the kinds of observations that show up the most often. Um, there's active work happening right now in the FHIR community to try to standardize the, the database representation uh, for these kinds of resources for writing analytics queries. There are some kinds of conveniences that um, allow you to write queries that are a little more natural. So one example is if you're querying over data with a lot of extensions or um, a lot of repeated codes where there's different vocabularies that are used to encode data, uh, it could be very uh, convenient, sort of more ergonomic for developers to have a nice shorthand for doing those kinds of queries. And so I've linked here to the uh, Fire Storage and Analytics track. There have been a couple of connectathons, and there's an active discussion on the Fire chat at chat.fire.org uh, to work through these kinds of details and, and come up with a set of sort of rules and expectations for representing data uh, that makes it a little bit more convenient for this kind of analytics. And I already mentioned a little bit about our timeline, but I just want to wrap up by saying uh, we're in the process of conducting this security review and evaluation. We expect to have a spec published uh, and sort of ratified informally by this Argonaut group. Oh, I shouldn't have touched that cable. Um, but this is a good time in the presentation for the, for the thing to go away. It's fine. Uh, we're, we expect to have a, a spec published by this Argonaut group by the end of the year uh, and then to hand it off to HL7 for a more formal balloting process. Um, 
I want to highlight some open questions. So there's a set of performance questions about how well we can actually implement this on top of real world systems. Questions about the efficiency of formats like NDJSON versus things like, uh, like Parquet. Uh, there's a symmetric concept of an import operation that becomes particularly interesting uh, when you can start to export all the data from a server and you want to rehydrate another server somewhere else. Uh, maybe you want to spin up a new server uh, to be able to run analytics queries against without interrupting um, the actual workload of a server that's doing operations. Um, and then there's a large set of questions about how you manage groups. So if you're doing exports on a whole group of patients at once, how did that group get defined? Which patients belong to it? Uh, who can create a new group uh, to serve as the basis of that export? And so there's some active discussion happening about how to use some of the fire, regular fire REST API to manage the membership of those groups that serve as the basis uh, of the export. So a couple ways to get involved today. Uh, inside of the main specification, which I'll, I'll show you in just one sec, there is a link to reference implementations, both servers as well as clients. So depending on whether you're interested in, in exposing data or consuming data through these APIs, uh, there's a, a growing set of things that you can connect to uh, and try it out, including some open source reference implementations on both sides. Uh, there's a link here to the specification itself, which just lives um, in this GitHub repository, Smart on Fire, Firebulk Data Docs. And this spec is effectively two pages. There's one that describes the export APIs and one that describes that s security API, backend services. Uh, and we haven't yet even tried to like render this to a fancy web page. We're just using the GitHub uh, markdown rendering and saying, you know, if you, if you want to read the spec, you just come here and read it uh, in, the, in the preview in GitHub. And so far that's worked fine. At some point we'll, we'll get around to doing a proper job of publishing it. Um, and then links as well in this deck to the reference implementations that I showed you and the discussion group, which is the bulk data stream uh, in the fire chat. So I will pause there. And if there are questions or comments, I think we've got a, a few minutes to open up the floor. Anybody? Thoughts? Please. I mentioned the word de-identification in passing, um, mostly to say it's something that we think is important but out of scope. Um, but we've talked with a few groups who are interested in sort of building this as a component of a pipeline, which is to say we, we don't think it's part of the bulk data API, but we think it's something that should play very nicely with the bulk data API. And you could imagine building sort of this transformation step, ingesting data through this API, and then re-exposing it through this API uh, with a de-identification step in the middle. Uh, yeah, please. So the question is whether there's a requirement to export a consistent state. Um, and the short answer is no. Uh, and there are a few notions of consistency that might be relevant in this context. Uh, referential integrity is a great example. If, if you're exporting uh, a resource that links to another resource, or you know, are you supposed to include the referenced resource? Uh, what we say today is a couple things. We say uh, the server that's in charge of the export uh, should do sort of use its discretion to figure out a data set that actually makes sense given what the client requests. Uh, and we say that if you're exporting data about a group of patients, Fire defines something called the patient compartment, um, which is, uh, if folks haven't seen it, it's worth knowing sort of where this exists in the Fire spec. What is that? Wow. Uh, should we do this right now? <laughs> I'm going to review some key points about Google's privacy. Are you ready, ready to review them with me? I agree. Okay. Um, that's coercive. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so Fire defines this thing called a patient compartment, which is sort of a set of resources that are associated with a patient. And we don't have a hard and fast rule about this compartment, but we, what we say is if you're doing data export as an EHR system, you should look at this compartment definition and basically think about exporting all the data that sort of belong to this compartment if it makes sense inside of your system. So it's pretty squishy language that we've used, um, but it was sort of the, the strongest thing that we could say that we could get clear agreement about. <laughs> Other questions or comments? And then, yeah, please. I, I can provide very little details on the pipeline architecture. Um, oh, uh, for, you mean from the perspective of this slide? This is really a sketch. The goal is simply to say, we think that if all we provide is this little arrow, if we can cover this with a standardized API, this will allow many developers to build interesting components that do things like data transformations and translations. 
in a way that works with this API without our having to standardize these kinds of pieces. So it's really just a way of sort of breaking down the world of problems and saying that stuff is out of scope, but it plays well with what we're specifying. Other thoughts, comments? Way in the back, please. Yeah, so the question is whether there's been an attempt or discussion about how to specify a way for clients to request um, subsets of the elements in a resource. So we talked about a way to ask for only specific resource types. We talked about this um, experimental way to limit within those types exactly which resources get filtered. There actually hasn't been much discussion about how to specify which elements in a resource are exposed. Um, but I could imagine doing something very similar to this type filter to use the, the fire underscore elements provision as an elements filter. That, that would be a pretty natural uh, kind of approach to take. Yeah, please. Yeah, so the, the question is, you know, and, and is, is a system like this really geared towards sort of chunk-based exports, and is, is there thought about more of a stream-like interface? And so one way to answer this question is to say that this is not necessarily chunk-based. It's designed to work well in a chunk-based world, but if you look at the way even that our reference implementation works, it streams results directly out of the database, uh, when a client goes to fetch those files. So it's very quickly able to generate a list of URLs, but each of those URLs does not represent a static file that's sitting somewhere. It represents another query that the server is able to stream results back into. Um, so we like this design because it allows you to work at file level chunks and static files, but if you're sort of careful about it, you can also stream data in this world. It, it doesn't give you the opportunity to stream individual results as they arrive, but that was sort of out of scope for the, the basic uh, problem we were trying to solve here. Other thoughts or questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is whether we thought about exporting uh, history or historical version lists for resources uh, beyond just the current state. Um, the short answer is I don't think there's been even discussion on this point. Um, it's an important one. Other questions? All right. Well, thanks a lot.